to the crowd here. I was saying with now only those are here who really want to do the work. All the tourists are gone. <laughs> Um, let's get going then. Uh, welcome to the third and last OAuth work group meeting. Uh, can I get a volunteer to help Hannes with taking notes, please? Okay, thanks Hannes and Christina for taking notes. Appreciate that. Let's get going. Okay, the note well, um, hopefully we're Friday, so hopefully you're familiar with this one. So, okay. Um, please make sure to log in to the Meet Echo application. It helps us if know how many people uh, attend and plan for future uh, meetings to make sure we have a comfortable room. Um, it also allows you to join the mic if you want to say anything. And, uh, and here's our agenda for today. Um, we start with George talking about uh, transaction tokens. Uh, Peter will then talk about identity chaining. Um, Ned will be talking about the use of attestation DCR. Is that the name or right? right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I got the name correctly. Okay. Um, Aaron will be talking about first party native applications and later global token revocation. And we have extra time for any other business. So. Um, that's that's our so yeah <laughs> ridiculous eh? <laughs> okay uh, I I see a few people joined the, um, the the room a bit late so please scan the the code and and join the Meet Echo um, application okay any comments about the agenda any agenda bashing. If not, George. You drive. All right. Uh, good afternoon, George Fletcher. Um, uh, Peter's here at Tool. I think it's 4 a.m. for him, and he got in really late last night, so I don't know that he'll be online remote. Um, next slide. Next one. Sorry, there are there are some breaks in here. Maybe I need to learn how to make uh, slides better. Um, so we'll start off a little bit with just sort of what are these things that we're calling transaction tokens and, and why do we have them or sort of what's the rationale behind them uh, before we get into sort of what's changed from the last time you presented it, um, 117. So the goal of transaction tokens are really to look at um, sort of authorization within the context, w within a sort of multi-workload or microservice environment where you want um, to sort of create an immutable context for the transaction as it traverses through multiple um, workloads. Um, today, in most of the systems I've seen, um, you have server-to-server -server trust between your uh, workloads, but generally nothing that sort of dealing with stuff at the transaction level. So, you know, um, this could be, you know, Anything uh, from, uh, you know, a, a simple a simple request, uh, you know, like you know, adding a stock to a watch list or, or something of that nature, might still go through multiple services. And and how do you sort of maintain that the the user of the request is George, and you know, maybe it came from this originating IP address, and um, uh, you know, this is the stock ticker that should be added. Um, so, uh, it's a mechanism to allow us to create that immutable context. Uh, they are short lived. Um, and the expectation is that in a microservice environment, you really can't have atomic transactions. So if something fails partway through, 
um, uh, you really sort of can't roll stuff back. And so if you authorize a transaction at the beginning of a request um, or at the edge of your network, then you should probably let it go through. So the, the theory behind this is when the initial request hits the external endpoint or potentially is minted internal to your trust boundary, you would um, create a short-lived token that represents the context of the, of the request. And then it can basically be passed through all the services directly um, because you want that transaction to complete um, as opposed to current environments where if you were passing an OAuth token through all of these different things and each of them are going back to validate the OAuth token, right? You could have a authorization failure partway through which might actually create more problems. Uh, and then finally, um, getting this additional context gives the ability to downscope, especially in a, um, an environment where you're coming from a consumer into a consumer environment, like a mobile app or something with OAuth, your scopes tend to be very coarse grained. Like, you know, I want to read mail and I want to write mail. Um, but maybe what I'm trying to do is add a, add a contact to my address book, um, which is much finer grained in the sense of the capability. So we'll talk about that. So next slide and next one. Um, sorry. Um, so, so the main things that we've done to the draft um, since 117, and I, I feel like we're narrowing, we have some open questions, but we're narrowing down on this, is um, we had, there's two concepts in the draft today. One of them is sort of like the, the creation of a transaction token at the beginning of the transaction when the request hits your network or when it's minted. When I talk about minting transaction tokens, think about something like inbound email, right? I may not, I, I get something off of the SMTP protocol, right? And now I wanna create a transaction token that basically says, deliver this mail message to George's mailbox. Um, one of the key points being there is that if I can bind this into the immutable context of the transaction, a compromise of an intermediate server can't change the delivery of that, you know, deliver it to a different mailbox. Um, so that's one way to get a transaction token. And then the spec also talks about a way to sort of like get a replacement transaction token. Um, we also had this concept of nested transaction tokens and we didn't, um, uh, we didn't have good uses for them. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so there was a lot of complexity, a lot of security implications. We didn't have a lot of good use cases, so we took these out. Next slide. Um, we did add a bunch of new claims. Um, audience in this context of a transaction token represents the trust boundary. So if you think about um, your, because uh, and this is important because uh, the next talk will talk about you know chaining across trust boundaries, but within your sort of backend infrastructure, Right, if you consider that a trust boundary or maybe you have multiple trust boundaries, but within a trust boundary, right, transaction tokens are meant to be scoped to a single trust boundary. So the audience claim then gives you a way to basically identify what that trust boundary is. The purpose claim is allows you to basically, this is the mechanism that allows you to downscope the, the actual transaction from maybe the, the larger external authorization model. At the end of the day, some of the principles here are that the authorization model for entities outside your network are probably a different authorization model than you have internal to your network. And, um, and because of that, this gives you a way to sort of bridge the transaction tokens, give you a way to bridge those authorization models. And then the purpose gives you a way to basically assert the intent of this particular transaction. Next slide. Um, there's also an authorization details. I mean, you want to think this is a little bit equivalent to RAR if you, um, in the sense of if you have other, other details about the transaction that should be immutable, right? You don't want some intermediate server to be able to change them, right? Then you can put them in here. Um, this does create some interesting aspects when you think about APIs and API driven backends. Um, so I think there's some thought here, but this is the, the purpose of this claim. Uh, next slide. And then we also added a request context object. Um, we defined three subclaims. Uh, this obviously can be extended, you know, talking about requesting IP, you know, the sort of authentication method, um, which workload requested it. Um, uh, and you can think of other things, like if it was an OAuth world, you might want to stick the client ID in here um, as the requesting workload identifier or, or something of that nature. Next slide. So here's sort of the updated example. 
Um, the original one was a little bit had was a little bit confusing. So, um, you know, all the sort of standard Jot claims were using the subject identifier out of the um, security uh, events model, um, as well as the transaction claim, which is also defined in the security events uh, mechanism. The transaction uh, claim there allows you to basically track this particular transaction throughout your network. Um, the, the request context, the purpose, and then the authorization. So in this case, the purpose is trade stocks. And then you have you know, information about that particular request in the authorization details. Next slide, one more. All right, so getting to the open questions, um, there's a couple of things that are open. They're not, I, I don't think they're sub super substantive, but um, things we are talking about, you know, is transaction token really an authorization token? Or if you're using the authorization header in your back end to carry client authentication as in a two-legged bearer token or some other mechanism, you're not using MTLS to do server-to-server -server trust, then should there should these really be in a separate space so you can continue to use your authorization header for client authentication mechanisms? And then this is a sort of an adjunct to that. Um, Justin's, you know, has some work around, you know, token buckets and, you know, maybe that's a space here. Maybe they can go in both places, you know, they can use either or. Um, so this is sort of an, an open space, you know, would love to have comments either here or on the repository as an issue. Um, but that's one of the open questions. Next slide. Um, there's been some discussion around subject, you know, should we allow for a simple subject versus using the subject ID claim? Uh, I think that this discussion is sort of resolving into only allow the subject ID claim because in this particular case, the subject of the transaction token is not a subject of the issuer of the transaction token. So if you think about having a, a transaction token service in your trust domain and it's going to issue, the issuer is sort of the token service, right? The subject is maybe the subject that came out of the OAuth token. And because those are different Right, you need the subject ID to contain the issuer of the orig you know, the originating subject, and not just be um, a subclaim with, you know, in some cases without an issuer. So I think this one's resolving, but if anybody has really strong opinions on why we need to support a simpler submodel and how it would work, um, you know, we'd love to have that feedback as well. Next slide. Um, so this sort of gets related, you know, is the issuer claim, should it be required or should it be optional? Um, if it's not there, what do you do about key rotations? Um, again, I think because the context says that the, the issuer of the transaction token is kind of different than the issuer of the subject, it should be there. Some people might claim, you know, because it's a single trust boundary, I can assume that the issuer is always the token, token issuer of the, of the trust domain. Um, but I think there are some cases where, you know, Peter's back there shaking his head. There are some cases where you may want your token, uh, your token issuing services, your transaction token issuing services to be distributed still within the same trust boundary. And so you might actually want different issuers. They may be using different keys to sign the transaction tokens. Um, so again, I think this one's resolving a little bit, but it is still an open question. We have not, uh, put any spec language yet around this. Next slide. Um, and then uh, sender constrained, you know, should to transaction tokens be sender constrained? And this gets to be a really interesting question. It's, you know, you're, you're within the domain, within a single trust boundary. Um, you have client authentication in most cases. Um, is, there, is there really a need to sort of sender constrain it? Because you don't really want, it, normally when you think about sender constraining, you're basically saying, this transaction token was issued to this particular service and it's allowed to present it somewhere, right? And in that context, that sort of is antithetical to what we're trying to do with transaction tokens in some ways. Um, so again, there's, a, there's an issue on the GitHub repository for this topic. Um, I, I could potentially see some binding to say that this client authentication request may be bound to this particular transaction token, but I'm not sure about the rest of it. I think really what people want in trying to, in thinking about sender constraining and transaction tokens is, 
do I have a secure call chain path? Like where has this trend, you know, what services has this transaction passed through to get to me? I think maybe more relevant. And again, there's some other work um, in this space that might help with that particular, um, that particular issue uh, that's sort of outside the scope of the transaction token spec. Okay, next slide. And so that was it in the sense of the updates. What we'd like to do is to um, ask for work group adoption of the specification. And, um, but so, if there's any comments or other. Yeah. Any questions, comments first, let's, let's you're on. You're on chef, uh, two comments or oh, two questions. Uh, can you explain what downscoping is and how you achieve it when you don't allow for nested tokens? Sure. So, so in this particular context, think about a mobile client that's doing, uh, that's the, that, you know, when I went and did my sort of established my mobile client and I went through my OAuth flow or OpenID Connect flow, I basically said um, this client, you know, I give consent to this client to, you know, do both read and write um, financial transactions. Generally, they're very coarse grained, right? Now, when that mobile app goes and says, I want to, you know, transfer this much money from this account to this account, right? The downscoping is basically saying when the transaction token is issued, the only thing that you know, the back end system can do is transfer this amount of money from these from so this at account the top to of the transaction, not attenuation later on. Right. Okay, got it. And well, I guess a comment. Um, part of my day job is to chase PII across our environment. And when I see the IP address embedded in your transaction token, I cringe. Sure. Um, the, at the very least, there should be a privacy consideration about that or, yep. well, personally, I would just remove it as an example. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the interesting thing is um, there are, there may be, uh, there's a couple of things, right? So I understand the privacy stuff and I completely agree we should have a privacy considerations section and talk about, you know, the amount of context data that you put in, right, um, and and how you how you potentially could blind that um, some of that data, but from a anomaly detection, from a security perspective, having that information that can be correlated to the transaction ID as it flows through the system can also be really useful. So th th it's that kind of balance between the the privacy consideration side and the and the security benefits, but. Yes. It um, may be useful, but it certainly makes it more difficult to chase stuff that's now embedded in tokens and people will never, ever change. Right. Um, right. So what would you consider about guidance that basically says if you want to track information that might be of you know, personal information nature, that it becomes hashed as a value you know, when the transaction token is issued? it you know creates a hashed value of it that's um, certainly better okay yeah. thank you justin uh, sorry uh, just speak. just once uh, you're on um go back to mike sorry <laughs> uh, like do you support that like what, what do you think about the document and the concept and and the idea like is that something that you think it's we should be working on something that you you support? I, I honestly haven't thought about it enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, okay. it goes into um, workload, uh, so uh, the whole workload area. So obviously yeah. uh, I'm interested, but whether it's in general, like very useful, mm -hmm. I cannot say. Okay, thanks, Yaron. Um, basically uh, guidance in the spec to hash or obfuscate any data that might be considered PI. Justin. Hi, Justin Richer. Um, so I do think that this is uh, good and important work. Um, I also think that it's got uh, two aspects that I think are going to be tricky to uh, help people navigate where and how to use this. 
Uh, one is that it looks and feels like an access token, and people will be tempted to just treat it like an access token, which you exactly address with, do we just put this in the authorization header or not? I lean towards not, not. Uh, for that reason, but also uh, in addition to that, uh, Jot as a format for carrying this is almost ancillary to the purpose of uh, the token itself. Um, you know, this is really talking about the semantics of the payload and, um, and sort of the value that that brings. And which makes me think of things like SDJOT would potentially be a, uh, a possible container for something like this to allow for uh, different bundles to be passed through the system, for example, uh, so that they could be masked to different parts of the workload and whatnot. And I know it's definitely harder to abstract to, uh, away from like the simplicity of it, it's a JOT, treat it like a JOT is, is wonderful. Um, but I think there might be something more there. I don't know exactly what that is, but this to me feels like something that's not quite an access token that we definitely want to be able to carry through requests in uh, in a bunch of different ways though. Uh, so I support the work, not sure if OAuth is the right place for it for all of those reasons, because it's not, to me, it doesn't really feel like an access token-y kind of thing. But I also don't think that there is a better place in the IETF yet. For Does it, it have to be an access token to be able to adopt it here? Is that like, it's a token that you could use with? Uh, there's a lot of things that I could call a token that we shouldn't be working on here. So okay, hey, Justin, would know. you mind um, adding an issue about the you know potential leverage of SDJOT and some thoughts around that? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I can. Uh, I can. I can do that. Uh, well, th thanks, thanks, Justin. Um, Cedric. Uh, yes, thanks. So yeah, I have also a question on the uh, purpose of the transaction tokens. In particular, we describe it as something that is used as the transaction is live to help it complete, but uh, it, uh, it also provides uh, a strong evidence, sign evidence to do auditing a long time after the transaction has completed, and uh, which is interesting, but also uh, possibly problematic for privacy. So I, I wanted to know if it's an intended, legitimate purpose of the transaction token, or if uh, it's just a token that is considered while the transaction is live, and then should be discarded. So I guess um, one of the drivers uh, for me um, was sort of twofold. One, right, most systems being just server-to-server -server trust, right, that if you, if you compromise an intermediate server, right, then you can basically change the parameters of the quote unquote transaction and make it do something else, right? And so being able to create an immutable thing that starts at the beginning and allows those critical elements to not be changed is a big piece. The other piece is that oftentimes, um, depending on what kind of a token was being used internally, um, it required going back to the IDP to basically validate it, which has, significant performance implications. So basically making these short live so you don't have to worry about revocation and, um, and allowing them to flow through the system, right, gave you a performance benefit. And then third, what I've found, and I don't know about the rest of your systems, but I'd be curious to know, is that it, it's unusual for there to be known pathing through the systems. When this transaction is occurring, it runs through these microservices. And knowing that from a security perspective and an anomaly detection perspective would be huge, right? So having something that is immutable that carries the identifier of the transaction all the way through gives you those benefits. So those are sort of the three of the key drivers. There's some others, but those are three of the key drivers for me personally and you know, embarking on this work. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Mike Jones, George, you know me. You know that I often look to see, are things consistent? So um, I looked at how your spec is using the TXN claim that's defined by sec events and was kind of surprised that the only place it occurs is in an example. That's a bug. OK. Um, so that's another I, and, and we, I we, haven't we, reviewed the spec in detail. I thought I'll look at that detail as we speak. Um, no, that's great. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Mike.
Yeah, we, we talked about it on the call. Yeah. Ned. Hi, Ned Smith. Uh, so there was a whimsy buff earlier uh, this week where the main focus was on workflow, uh, you know, attestation and auditing and a bunch of other things. It seems like that overlaps with, with steps four through six. So potentially assuming that buff you know, matures into a working group, that might be a reasonable place for this work. It, it might be, I think, you know, the, the thing we're sort of dealing with there is just, um, you know, timing issues and is that buff going to get spun up and, you know, so that's why we started here, right? Because it's related to, you know, internal authorization in some way, even if it isn't a full authorization token. So maybe, maybe there's like a charter discussion yeah. you know, at some point in time. So the, there is a charter discussion that will happen. Like we kind of had some some initial thought about like what, what needs to be done for the charter, but we don't have something specific yet. So thanks, Ned. Uh, no. Peter. Uh, yeah, just very quickly. I think one of the other reasons this work is particularly interesting uh, to me is it also gets us out of actually passing access tokens throughout the system. Uh, this is a very common pattern uh, that gets used in architectures, but it's not standardized. And one of the, the reasons that is a problem is as we start uh, connecting uh, multiple systems across multiple clouds, the absence of a standard way for doing this mm -hmm. uh, is going to come back to bite us. And so yeah. I, uh, I think uh, you know, those are two just very pragmatic things. Um, one, it, it's a security improvement. Uh, and two, uh, it's going to give us interoperability and align with that long-term vision that we have. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was saying. Okay, do we did we get to the yeah, perfect? Um, uh, Brief at the night just uh, talked a few minutes ago, um, but we thought we would still do an, uh, a call for adoption, and then we can, depending on how the charter discussions work out. We may need to shuffle things around, but I think that's okay. Uh, it's not a big drama, but we get some work done and, and then we see where yeah. it ends up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we did get some conflicting kind of views here. So that's the reason that maybe let, let's try to get a feeling of, yeah, like, yeah I just want to get a feeling of uh, what's the room in general. And then after that, we could make a decision. Okay. So, um, okay. Yeah. Let me unlock the, the queue for Brian. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. It's hard to know when or what to say. The, I've, I've not reviewed it in detail, but I have skimmed through it. And I, I'm of the mind that it's, it's not ready yet. Um, there's some maturity issues here. Some of the main OAuth stuff that it does in the use of token exchange is just syntactically not, um, it's, it's, erroneous it's not right um there's some other problems the claims are um as mike said at least in some cases they're not defined or they're only used in examples um conceptually i know there's something here but i i'm i don't feel that this document is is ready to roll or ready to be considered for, for adoption at this point uh, brian a question like when you say it's not ready yet uh ready for as a starting point for the work in the group or ready for Working group last call. <laughs> Definitely I'm, not the latter. I hope you meant the former, like, right? Well, we're, we're not talking about working group last call, are we? Like, no, no, I was, I was joking a little bit. Uh, oh. Like, um, my expectation is always like uh, for an initial document, like with many others we had in a group, is like, is this like conceptually something that, uh, like, there's a problem uh, that uh, we just have heard. Uh, um, various speakers and George in particular talking about and is that something a, a problem space that you guys see as well um, is that sort of like a rough uh, uh, first start and then um, like we always sort of change everything afterwards anyway uh, uh, as it gets adopted we've had this presentation a few times on this on this document already so um, like that's the type of feedback I'm, I'm trying to get I know different groups have different uh, a different bar for what they consider as a starting point, um, but that's that's my starting point uh, assumption. 
so may maybe we can split it into two steps. Like if we can ask if people are interested in solving the problem mm -hmm. and, and after that, we'll ask about if this document is a good starting point. Okay, is that, is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, okay let's, yeah, that, that's what I'm gonna use. Okay. Get ready to use the tool. It's also the, oh, it's her. It's very interested. Oh, yeah. Yes, we could be interested in solving the, the problem. Just solving the problem. The problem? It's good. Okay. okay. Can you please vote? Is the work group interested in solving this problem? It, for, like it doesn't have to be that the doc, this document, but the, the problem in space, right? Okay. Can I give you a few more seconds? Okay. Do you want to capture this? So we have. 24 yes, four no, 21 no opinion. No opinion is the, the one speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's ask the second question. Uh, second question. This is awkward. This still should come on. Um, Yeah, I'm sure I always have that starting point. No, the point is gone. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. on like that, the whole thing. Should we adopt that transaction? Hopefully, like, there is uh, yeah. a typo. That There's a typo point. just <laughs> as a starting point. Please vote. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay. okay, that's it. Okay, so 15 yes, four no, and no opinion. Okay, okay, <laughs> so. You good, guys? You're no. fighting there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fighting with yeah. yeah, okay, awesome. George, thank you very much. Uh, we will take it to the list, obviously. But yeah, we need to confirm it. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, this is, it's always, uh, the list is, is the final one, okay? Thank you, George. Okay. Okay. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. It's uh, just this, while you opening your slides, I was in a different group uh, this week, I won't say which one, and uh, there were three people interested in a, in a document, and they said it's uh, a tremendous interest, uh, so that the bar for what is interest and what not is very different in different groups. Uh, it's really interesting to observe that. Did you get it? Uh, yeah, I have control. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, Hi, everybody. Peter Castleman. I am going to talk a little bit about identity chaining across trust domains, a little bit related to what George has been talking about, because it's also about preserving uh, context uh, as um, transactions move across trust boundaries. Um, so uh, I want to 
really thank my uh, uh, my co-authors and contributors, Arndt, um, uh, Kelly, I think you're here, Mike and Brian uh, has joined uh, our crew of uh, uh, our merry band of uh, uh, identity chaining enthusiasts. Um, and uh, that means we also get much higher quality pictures uh, to start our presentation <laughs> with. So thanks, Brian. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenge of identity chaining, just as a reminder, uh, sort of our proposed approach. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what's in the draft and then maybe get a feeling for folks in this room uh, or in the meeting on where we should go with this work next. Um, so I think first off, uh, so <clears throat> starting out, right, I, uh, this picture, I think you may have seen this before. Uh, so typically when um, you look at a, what we call a resource server, it's really sort of ends up cons being constituted out of multiple uh, services. There's typically some kind of gateway and, um, and then several services down, uh, in this case, the bar service. Uh, still needs to know who was the original resource owner, what authorizations did they grant, what other entities were involved, and what authorizations did they have. And some of this, uh, so in the previous uh, 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 discussion, the transaction tokens that George talked about sort of helps us answer those questions within a trust domain. Um, However, uh, when we start moving across trust domains, we still want to be able to uh, have answers for the same things, right? So if you're in trust domain one and you're calling into trust domain two, you're going to call another resource server, uh, which is constituted of, yet again, a number of subservices or microservices. And again, right, by the time that the request comes down to the very last service, uh, you still want to know who was the resource owner, what was the authorizations they granted, who else was involved, um, and what authorization do they actually have. Um, and so, um, and of course, we want to be able to do this in a, an environment where uh, people are using OAuth uh, already. So, um, so here are some conceptually how we're thinking about solving this problem. And I, I, again, also want to thank Brian for helping us out with uh, some of the details as we've been digging into uh, this part. But essentially, um, we're, we're pro really proposing using two existing uh, specifications that this working group's already produced. One is token exchange and the other is the assertion framework. And so how we would like to propose and standardize um, uh, this approach for uh, cross-domain identity chaining is uh, you know you start off with a um, a client in the first domain. They uh, uh, they use token exchange uh, to get an authorization grant, and then they use that authorization grant and they present that to the authorization server and trust domain two to get an access for that. And then from there on, uh, you know. Uh, it's just um, th that client then can present the access token. So that's kind of the, the very high level um, and sort of looks like this. If we were to draw a picture, um, uh, you'll see the client sort of floating, not attached to a resource server or the authorization server. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the next slide, but this is really sort of the flow, right? Do token exchange, um, use the surgeon framework and then present the token. So when, as we've talked about that uh, within the conversation, there sort of really turned out to be two models in which we want to use this pattern. The first one is for one of those microservices themselves, uh, one of the, in this case, uh, the Foo service, to actually act as a client itself. Um, and so take whatever token it has, exchange it, uh, get that assertion grant, um, go to the other authorization server, and then present it um, uh, uh, to the gateway in the next service. And so, uh, and that is sort of one model. And in this model, of course, um, from a security perspective, we're okay with a, a client in trust domain one, knowing about the authorization servers in trust domain two. Um, there's also sort of, a, I'm good, we're, I think we call it high assurance. Uh, there's high assurance use case where the client's actually the authorization server itself. Um, 
And so uh, in that case, we didn't want the authorization server in domain one to know about the authorization server. Uh, so we didn't want the client in domain one to know about the authorization server in domain two. Uh, and so in that case, it is still the same flow, uh, but, uh, the, um, uh, uh, but in the end, uh, uh, it's really the authorization server acting as the, as the client. Okay, so a little bit about what's in the draft. QR code for anybody. Anybody? QR code? Um, uh, so first of all, we sort of <laughs> look at the QR codes over there, and we ask them to scan them previously as well. Uh, but that aside. Uh, you're helping me, Hannes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, so first, uh, we described the sort of generic cross-domain identity chaining and uh, how that should be used. And then in the appendices, we talk specifically about uh, how this looks if the resource server is the client, uh, as well as when the authorization server acts as, as the client for this um, uh, identity chaining example. Um, we sort of have a very light token exchange profile. Uh, at the, one of the open discussion points actually for us is uh, the token type. So, you know, one proposal is maybe we should restrict that to being JAW tokens only. Um, I think uh, in, in some cases we, we're sort of balancing there between more interoperability and more flexibility. And I think that's still sort of an open question for us to, to figure out which way we, we should go. Um, now there's also an assertion flow profile. Um, and then I think uh, uh, sort of um, uh, a section on how claims transcription or, or what claims should be dis uh, uh, transcripted uh, and some, some guidance on that. Um, and then I think the other piece, uh, so we did present this at IETF 117. Uh, there's sort of several um, uh, changes that was made and again, Many thanks to Brian for helping us uh, come up with uh, b both fixing things that were wrong as well as uh, refining and uh, getting a little sharper on the text itself. Um, the next steps are remaining open questions. So there's really sort of two, uh, two things, right? So one is uh, considering the limitation of the token formats uh, and then just how specific we need to be in terms of you know, should we define specifically uh, how uh, uh, claims should be transcribed uh, as well, or, or specific um, formats for how this uh, claim should be described. Um, so I think next steps, one of the questions at this point we've been, uh, so this, this work here uh, was initiated, I think Kelly, you first presented at IETF 114 in Philadelphia and we've sort of been evolving and debating and, and sort of teasing out what this might look like. And so at this point, I think we really want to sort of get a sense of whether there is interest to pursue this work mm -hmm. uh, and whether this is something that, um, you know, just trying to figure out if this is something that, that we, we should, if there's interest in the working group for this to continue. Okay, first, any, anybody has any comments uh, what, about the presentation? What were you? you saw here questions comments and and people please please mute your phone so we don't have to <laughs> hear this you get distracted john <laughs> <laughs> for the record christina is trolling john <laughs> hey, nothing oh. christina capture that please <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Mike. Mike. So, Mike Jones, I'll admit, I haven't read the draft. What do you mean by transcribing claims, if you think it's useful to say? Um, so, I think the thing that um, it is, how do we, if you, you know, let's say you have an access token, how should we define the mechanism for how those claims are preserved when you do uh, when you when you sort of apply for or uh, get that assertion grant, right? Should that be contained and and should that be uh, still be available? 
and, and how to do that. Uh, I don't know, Kelly, if you want to add to that in terms of the, the claim, you know, transcribing and preserving claims. Is, is it like encapsulating or? Uh, yeah, think of it as encapsulating, okay. right? So basically asking, I think the thing that we wanted to avoid was uh, in putting the, uh, an access token inside like that kind of problem. So it's really about, let's pull out the pieces that is really relevant and that we really want to preserve and uh, give people a way to, to move that across the trust domain. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. George. Yeah, so I, a little bit, Mike, to what you were saying, I think there's some really interesting problems that are worth solving here, um, especially when you start thinking about use cases with that involve users because the claims about a user in one domain may be quite different than the claims about the user in another domain and how do you sort of identify the user correctly and what does the authorization server in trust domain one not want to release about the user but still be able to get a token from authorization server two in any of these scenarios so i think that you know that also sort of comes into this aspect of encapsulating you know how do i how do i represent then write necessary information to the other authorization server to get the, the access token that I need to invoke the API without potentially leaking too much. So I, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Okay, so it seems obviously there is some interest, but like let, let me, let us just try to sense uh, and get the feeling from the room if, they are interested in this, so we're gonna. I don't know, maybe split it again, or should we just? Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Yes. Is the work group interested in solving this problem? Looks good. Awesome. Still going up. Okay, 24 yes and zero no. Awesome. That's one. Okay. Uh, close. Should we adopt? Let's see if I got it right. Should we adopt this document as a starting point? Again, we're talking about um, George's document here. Right? Peter. Uh, Peter, sorry. Yeah. We're voting on a different thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, do we sorry. need to retake the previous vote? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll, t I'll take the result. Apology. I'm Apology, sure you guys. Can do the point twice, even uh, <laughs> one after the other result would be different. <laughs> Let's take it so far. Give him a few more seconds. Okay. Okay. Looks looks good. Seventeen yes. Zero no. Perfect. We'll take it to, to the list to confirm it. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Okay. Two, two, two. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Let's see, Ned, right? Uh, what is that? The station. You want me to drive or do you want to drive? Uh, you can drive. Okay. Can you close, the huh? close one. Oh, close that.
Okay, go for it. Okay, I'm yeah. Ned Smith, and I'm here to talk about attestation for the registration endpoint. Next slide. So motivating use case, um, we're talking about client, a way for the, a client that's implemented as a confidential computing environment. And uh, the idea here is the client runs within this confidential computing environment. And we want to be able to uh, uh, determine or find out whether or not the client actually is in a confidential computing environment using attestation. And so the first step here is the client is configured with credentials and other metadata. Uh, and as part of that interaction, the, the client attests. So we'll go to the next slide. All right, so attestation and dynamic client registration. Basically, the attestation can be used with the, you know, different endpoints in OAuth. Uh, this this uh, a draft supports attestation within the registration endpoint. <clears throat> so we think it's complementary with the, the attestation-based client auth draft in, in the sense that it supports attestation for client authentication and, and where the, whereas this is focusing on the client registration step. Um, it's based on RAT's architecture in terms of terminology and concepts. So if you're familiar with that document, this will maybe resonate with you. Um, but the basic idea here is th that uh, it describes the communication patterns for background check and passport models. Uh, so, so that's something that's described in the RAT's architecture. Uh, the current draft has an explanation of the background check model, and we're in the process of um, adding uh, an explanation that is in the context of the passport model. So next slide. So here's basically how it looks. Um, the, you know, the purple bullets are essentially what this draft is focusing on, which is the, you know, the registration step, but as a pre-step to the registration, the client authenticates and um, attests to a rats, what we to, what's referred to as the rats verifier. Uh, and this is, this is the process of obtaining the passport, quote unquote. Um, and the passport essentially is an attestation result that says, hey, this client is inside of a um, confidential computing environment. That's then delivered to the AS and uh, the AS then proceeds as normal to do the dynamic client registration, which primarily involves, you know, provisioning the, the, the client, um, you know, um, context uh, information. And then it, it proceeds as, as normal from uh, steps three and four, where you obtain, a token, obtain an access token and then present the access token to the resource server. Next slide. So what's going on in each of these steps? So in the first step, the verifier checks that the client is a valid confidential computing environment. Uh, that's based on, could be based on lots of detailed information that's a, that can be obtained through attestation. Um, and there's a variety of different formats for doing that. And, uh, and then as a condition of the AS granting the access token, it essentially applies a policy that says if the if the um, client is is a within a valid CCE, then provision the DCR information into it. So this is uh, uh, based on a essentially the configuration of the AS. As a result of that, all the downstream resource servers essentially have a policy that says, "I'm going to use this particular AS because I know that he's performing this check." Okay, so. Uh, that's sort of how the entire system benefits from the knowledge that the client is in a confidential compute environment. Next slide. So we think the standardization effort is pretty minimalistic. It's mostly architectural. Um, there's a prototype uh, development work that's going on now, and we intend to get your feedback. Um, and then, of course, any inter anybody else who's interested in working on this, we certainly like to uh, you know find out who you are. And otherwise, uh, should we adopt this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, anybody has any comments first? So, it seems to me that when I look at the diagram that you have, 
and the diagram that was in the client attestation uh, uh, spec that we did Tuesday, I guess it was, or was it Thursday and Wednesday? Anyway, um, the, the core bits between client and some attester are exactly the same, right? And I think there's a huge amount of value in being able to get an attestation about the client, right? And the attestation potentially should be more than just, you know, uh, OS-based app auth, right? Or, or, or I mean, the OS-based app attestation, um, or maybe that's sufficient depending on the use case, right? I think then there's the the separation of that mechanism from how can you present a client attestation to multiple endpoints within the OAuth ecosystem? And I'm wondering if we can separate these two things. I, you know, I can't remember who said it when we were talking about the last time, but maybe it was you, Aaron who said that, you know, there's value in separating attestation from authentication, and we should be able to do both on many of our OAuth endpoints. And I, so I'm wondering, is it possible to combine these two things into a spec around, you know, how do you get an attestation? And there may be multiple kinds of attestations that could be retrieved. And then how do you present an attestation across a wider range of OAuth endpoints? So one of the things that we found beneficial in the rats working group is to sort of separate the idea of a, a role from an entity, which is to say, you know, the, the role just identifies some behavior that, that, um, you know, performs some particular, um, uh, you know, set of duties or tasks that role could be, could land on any, any combination of entities where, uh, a single entity can perform multiple roles. Uh, so, an AS as an entity could easily be a RATS verifier, or the RATS verifier could stand alone on a different entity. Right. That's, that's, it's intended to have lots of flexibility in that. Right. Way. And I think that's fine. I mean, just for me, conceptually, right, there is a client attestation step, right, yeah. or, or producing evidence about this client, right? And then there is a way to present that evidence, right? And I think if we separate those two things and make them you make the, the presenting of the evidence generic or have a standard way to do it that works across multiple endpoints, right? That would actually gain us mm. a lot of value. Yeah. Actually, and both documents do that. Uh, both documents already do that separation. Uh, right, so then can which, we merge which is good. them? Right. In other words, are they mm. really solving different problems or can we, can, can we have a, a single document that talks about <laughs> you know, client attestation evidence and presentation. So, so I think they're solving different problems, but those problems could be combined into sort of one step if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, I think George pretty much said everything I was going to say, but I just want to reiterate it. I think that uh, I'm extremely opposed to the idea of having two drafts that do very similar things in different, but different ways with different terminology, especially. There's a lot of terminology that's completely different between the two drafts, which I see as a huge problem since they are architecturally very similar. Um, so that's something to address probably in both documents. Um, I do, again, I just want to say that the attestation output of whatever that is, is useful at many different endpoints in the OAuth ecosystem. And there is no reason that it needs to be presented differently and have a draft per endpoint. That's just not scalable. So like, I really think we should try to combine these two, uh, to unify the language, unify the, the presentation of it and all that, and be able to then, by definition, apply it to other endpoints within the OAuth ecosystem without having to create a new draft to, to say how to do that. I'm happy to work with the you know, authors of the other draft on terminology. If that helps. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. Paul. Yeah. I'm probably mostly iterating what George and Aaron now said. Again, I think also the similarities are very obvious. Um, and if we take the feedback that we got on Wednesday, which was mostly what Aaron said, this should not only be maybe a client authentication scheme, but more like general uh, and apply that to our standard, then I think we pretty much arrive at that point. Um, and yeah, also to the point that What's called here the rats very far doesn't need to be the same entity as the client is also a discussion 
uh, that we had in, in our spec, which is also what we originally started with. The ideas that I had, uh, Tobias was a little bit skeptical about it. So we said in the, in the beginning, that should be the client backend. But in the discussions that we had in GitHub, we already loosened that up and we were already in the process to call that like a general attestation service. It doesn't need to be in general the, uh, the client backend. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think it would be better like just to merge the efforts and, and do that together. So yeah, it's also an invitation. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. John. Uh, so probably not surprisingly, I'm going to agree with all that has been said before me that um, essentially, if there's something that's specific about the CCE environment, that should be a profile on top of whatever the general purpose attestation, dynamic client <laughs> registration, um, just in time dynamic cl client registration, whatever we're calling the um, the authentication option, you know, register during authentication. But because the CCE environment is probably going to need to eventually do all those other things anyways. So we should figure out, we should figure out what the generic model is and perhaps do a CCE profile if there is in fact something specific. So I invite you to look at the RATS working group document list. There are, I think, three profiles that are published there. To get, just to give an example of what a profile might look like. Um, that said, if there is a sort of industry standard profile for a CCE, that would be interesting work. Again, I, I think I it's, you have it the, the wrong way around. This is a CCE profile of this attestation mechanism that can be applied to different endpoints in OAuth. Maybe, maybe that's just two ways of looking at the same thing. Uh, but yeah, I agree. But uh, I, I agree. I agree that yeah, there's probably uh, interesting work around defining a profile that applies to you know the OAuth community and the CCE community, and they sh they shouldn't be different. Right. So my speculation is that CCE may just be a specialization of what needs to happen in OAuth in general. Yeah. And we should understand yeah. it, and you know merge these two and divide it up as appropriate. Awesome. Thanks, John. Jacob. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jacob Um Yeah, I want to reiterate what George and Aaron said as well. I, I think this is a strong argument for not using attestation as uh, client authentication uh, as the only mechanism, because uh, that would that would prevent this or make it hard to use in this case. And, and I think this is a very valid use case to address dynamic client registration. There are many good good cases where that could be useful to have at the station for. Software statement could perhaps be used there, but then again, a more general base and then profiles on top would be preferable, I think. Uh, but it also makes sense to perhaps look even deeper at the claim definition of what that at the station token is and how to profile that on, on various ends. Okay, thanks, Jacob. Joseph. Thanks, uh, Joseph Heenan. Um, I just feeling slightly uncomfortable with people putting the pulls draft that targets endpoints that accept client authentication in get, with the DCR. Client. Joseph, get Sorry, closer. Am I? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'm just feeling comfortable that pulls draft that really targets endpoints that accept client authentication, trying to put those into the same bucket as dynamic client registration that has a different format request is, yeah, we should have the same. Got type of evidence presented, but it, we shouldn't try and force them to present it in exactly the same way. Okay. So, so, so just to jump, can I jump in here? So, no, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, 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 hold on, guys. I'll, just just one, can one second. Can I respond? Yeah. No, no. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think there's maybe two steps here. One is let's figure out the terminology so that we're sort of speaking the same language. And then we can take a look at, well, what are the goals of each? And are they different enough to keep them separate? Or are they similar enough to keep them the same? If we're saying, put them together because the terminology is screwed up and we want to get the terminology straightened out, that's probably not the best reason. Yeah, I mean, I'm 
I think having consistent terminology is good. I think it's just when we get down to the detail of exactly how you present it, yeah, that we shouldn't force the same mechanism for both. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, Hannes. Yeah, uh, chair head off. Um, terminology thing, like um, there's some terminology being worked on in the in the ITF Rats working group, and uh, the group needs to decide which terminology to use. Uh, I have a slight preference. I'm not an also of the Rats terminology, nor did I invent it. Uh, um, so that would be important for the group to find out because it's obviously quite confusing. Uh, it's unfortunate that some of the terms overlap, so that's why there's rats verifier because some of that documents, the VC documents, uh, for them the verifier is what the resource server here, kind of confusing, of course. Um, the other thing is um, this is one model that mimics closer to what Paul has been talking about uh, earlier this week, but there is also the other communication pattern that is in, in existence and deployed today that we would have to also support, which I talked about last time, and that's why uh, NET obviously doesn't repeat that again. So I think there's there's good stuff there. Okay, thanks, Hannes. Uh, Aaron, quickly, I close yeah, the, I, the queue. <laughs> I just wanted to say the uh, dynamic client registration spec explicitly says this endpoint can require client authentication. So the way I was seeing it was that this attestation is an input into the dynamic client registration endpoint. And if you want to call it client authentication, then you could actually just use this other draft that already calls a client authentication mm -hmm. on the registration endpoint. We don't need to write anything new. So that's why I was saying that like these are extremely related because it's all already it's all already there. Like I'll but that said, so I don't want to call client attestation client authentication because they are still different things and they're just useful at all the endpoints. Okay. So, so just, okay. just let me clarify quickly. So in the context of an attestation, the thing that we're, that's labeled client, it has an attestation identity that it can be used to um, authenticate to the rats verifier, but that may be different from the client identity that's used within the rest of the OAuth system to identify the, the client as a participant uh, Aaron, in that system. Which is exactly why it's not yeah. client authentication. Yeah. Okay, yeah. enough, enough. Uh, um, Brian, quick quick comment from you, and then we end it here. The, the, the other draft though that's doing attestation for client authentication is really just attesting to a key for a, an individual client instance, so that can be used for authentication. I, I understand like all the desire to kind of unify things and have things as one, but it, it is not, I'm, I'm not sure the parallels are actually as significant as, as are being put forward. And there's like, it, it's being used in a very specific way to sort of elevate what were previously public clients to something that can act as a confidential client. Um, I, I get, I get some of the concerns around it, but we're going to, I worry about losing the the actual intent and and functional value of that other draft if we try to merge things in and make them completely generic. But okay, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Um, sorry, I closed the mic. Well, I <laughs> Justin, go ahead quickly, please. <laughs> Aaron is right. The other draft is wrong. Uh, client uh, attestation should be usable at, uh, everywhere in parallel with client authentication. We shouldn't conflate the two. Thank you, Justin. Quickly and to the point. OK. I, like, I, I think th the next step is for the two groups to t sit together and talk about those and see if that makes sen sense to merge them. And then let's talk about this after that, after you, you guys get together and talk about it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Aaron. Uh, OK, let me hand you the, the reins here. There you go. And you have two presentations, and you have plenty of time, right? I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to stay on time for my own sake for the next presentation. So OK. It's your presentation. Um, OK, hi. I'm Aaron Parecki, Okta. Um, 
I first want to talk about OAuth for first party apps, which was a draft that I uh, presented here before along with uh, George and Peter. We have um, presented this sort of problem space in the past. I'd want to do a quick recap, recap of that before talking about the changes, uh, just to kind of set the stage. So in OAuth for mobile apps today, especially when um, they are using third party identity providers as most uh, social login kind of things do, we have this kind of experience of choosing how you want to log in. And then we see the mobile app platforms, OAuth APIs take over the web flow on iOS, starting with this little pop-up and then going into the safe browser for doing the authentication at the OAuth server. Bunch of proprietary logic happens here that is not specified anywhere because it's proprietary logic by definition. And we do multi-factor auth and et cetera, et cetera. And eventually the app is logged in. Great. This is excellent for the case where we're using OAuth for third-party applications because of all the protections that the mobile platforms give us, the isolation between the app and the browser, uh, existing, able to, to keep the session cookies for the IDP. Great. All, all these kinds of things are great. Um, however, in the first party case of building first party applications, developers want a better user experience uh, for those applications. And it is extremely driven by user experience. So um, people are finding ways to work around the recommendations laid out in 8252, which is the recommendations for mobile apps to talk about things like using that browser. Uh, they are doing DIY things for just building proprietary authentication APIs that mobile apps will use directly. They are just using the password grant, and then they don't have any real way to do better with that in the OAuth world. Um, OAuth servers create proprietary APIs to facilitate that kind of direct interaction. And I've even seen things like the mobile app opening up a hidden web view that it's able to then observe and scrape and inject passwords and stuff. And it's just lovely. Um, the point is that all of these things are worse than not having clear recommendations for how to let developers get a good user experience for first party applications. So with that out of the way, um, let's go over to the world of OAuth that we have today of doing the, um, the authorization code flow, redirect based author authorization code flow. It starts on the left with the OAuth client saying, go over to the authorization server and start the flow that contains a bunch of information about that request. And then OAuth says, eventually the user's browser is redirected back to the client with an authorization code and state and other parameters, which you can then exchange for a token. You might notice there's a giant hole in the middle of this diagram because a whole bunch of stuff happened in between the start and the end of that authorization code request and the authorization code being issued. None of that stuff is defined in OAuth specifications by design. That is all interactions between the user's browser and the authorization server where they have the account and might include things like registering for an account, how they actually authenticate, any kind of multi-factor auth, any kind of consent gathering, other things, other magic happens. It's a lot of stuff happens there. And this is, I would say, actually a success in the design of OAuth because that part of the system has been allowed to evolve independently of the OAuth client. So. If we take this to the mobile world um, and we try to provide a way to let apps give provide a, a native user experience, what we could do is define an auth, a, a similar authorization code flow, but now it's in quotes, uh, for, for first party applications where the part of the flow that's defined is just the outside start and end of the flow, but leave the inside bit still out of scope and not even try to get into how the actual back and forth happens, leaving that to be proprietary as it is in the authorization code flow for the web. So with that, it was the quick version. Um, a couple of the goals of the design of this document, um, use existing OAuth building blocks as much as possible, mirror the web version of the authorization code flow, which means defining how the client starts and ends the flow, but leave the specifics of authentication out of the framework as it should be. Um, that means that the specifics of authentication can be either proprietary proprietary to an authorization server like they are today, or we could define extensions for them, especially if those extensions are built on open standards like Fido WebAuthn, which is a really interesting idea that I think a lot of people would, uh, would use. 
So that takes me to the design of this draft, which basically adds a new endpoint, the authorization challenge endpoint. This is a new endpoint that accepts all the parameters that would have been included in the query string or in a par request uh, to the authorization endpoint. And it can include a, any extensions that are defined on top of OAuth, but it is the endpoint that accepts the post request from the client to start uh, and possibly then continue this back and forth sequence until eventually an authorization code is returned from this endpoint. Uh, so we just define this endpoint, which says here's how you start the flow, and eventually you get back an authorization code. Which means, importantly, at the token endpoint, there are no changes made to the token endpoint by this draft. The token endpoint accepts the authorization code that it got instead of from a redirect, it got the authorization code from this post request. Um, so I'm sure everybody's thinking, why a new endpoint? Um, the existing authorization endpoint, as defined in OAuth, is never interacted with by the OAuth client. It is only interacted with by the browser. It is explicitly a request from the user agent, which means it returns HTML. I have received a lot of feedback that suggests that people are unwilling to modify that endpoint to also return, for example, JSON. Just doesn't really make any sense because there's a lot of things you do to protect the authorization endpoint when you're expecting it to be interacted with by a browser. So that's the main justification for having this be a separate endpoint because we don't want to overload the authorization endpoint. Um, the other thing this draft does is define a couple of error responses. So any, um, we're not changing the token endpoint, but at any point the token endpoint could return an error code like it can today. That error code, there's a new error code defined that would, um, sorry, there is no new error code defined. The new, the error code can already say that the user needs to go log in again, which means the, the we already have the path to just kind of have the app start over from scratch and um, do a flow do the flow again. Um, the resource server can also include this error to say, hey, the user needs to go log in again, and it can use the step up authentication draft to do that. The resource server can say, hey, this access token is too old, or the user needs to log in again for whatever reason. Those are already fine in step up auth. We don't need to change any of that. The client now just would start a, a flow from scratch this new way instead of through a redirect. So uh, since last time we talked, we've gone through a bunch of changes on this again, tried to refine this and, and make it more consistent. Um, there was the poorly named device session that is now called auth session. It was not meant to imply that it was a persistent identifier for the device. It's really meant to identify the particular transaction of obtaining the authorization code. So um, that's hopefully a better name. We can still bike shed it later. Um, the other uh, big thing is that we added a explicit error code that is a uh, redirect response. And this is kind of the, like, in some cases, authorization server actually does still doesn't want to accept this kind of direct back and forth and does actually want to get the user out into a browser for whatever reason. Um, that could be because it doesn't, it no longer trusts the application because maybe the attestation changed and failed, or maybe because the um, the client doesn't have the code required to do this kind of new MFA type that they shipped in the authorization server but haven't updated the SDK with yet. So in these kinds of exception cases, the authorization server could just say, I'm not going to you know, stop interacting with the user, open a browser, and just do a normal OAuth flow there. Um, there is a new section that talks about, about these design goals that went into this. Um, we also added a section about how you can layer Depop in with the specification to have key bound tokens. And interestingly, we removed the term native from the name of the spec. <clears throat> And the reason is because I went through and read what we had written, and actually nothing about it was specific to native apps. Now, I'm, I'm on the fence about this, um, but it felt like an a OK change because there wasn't actually, like nothing about what we're, we were doing actually was tied to mobile or even native applications. However, that is the intended use of it. So this is why I could go back and forth on this. Um, it is clearly intended for native apps, be that mobile or desktop. It's not really intended for single page apps, although you could technically do it. Um, you could technically do it in a web server based app too, but it doesn't really make any sense to because you're already in a browser and redirects aren't even a problem there. So yeah, yeah. Um, we can discuss that. Um, kind of more important discussions are, uh, there's a lot of interest in using Fido as an OAuth grant, using a 
passkey, WebAuth, and whatever to exchange that for an access token directly. And what that would do is let you get a extremely good user experience in a mobile app where no browser appears. You just do the, the phone thing to do the passkey challenge and then exchange that in the back end for an access token. Ideally, that we could do that using this as the framework to, to build that. Um, that would require that the client has to get in that initial challenge that it uses in that grant, kind of like getting a Depop nonce, which I, is kind of a Depop does it a weird way where it makes a request that it knows will fail and then uses that to get the nonce back. Anyway, there's a lot, a lot. This actually seems to be a common theme in a lot of the kind of new stuff we're doing is that clients need nonces and we have just kind of had to figure out how to shoehorn nonces into things. So maybe there's a maybe there's something there. Um, but yeah, the, the, I guess the other question is, uh, is there any interest in actually working on a specifically a profile of this framework where we do define an authentication mechanism, which is pass keys or WebAuthn? Um, and I think that's it. That's it. So Dimitri. Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri Zagadulin. Uh, my in terms of getting the initial nonce, I'm wondering if, let me back up. So for PSYOP version two and for using OpenID for credential issuance and OpenID for presentation, implementers have this same problem. They need to get a, a nonce and um, uh, an API endpoint, which this does also, to send that nonce to, to kick off the, the interaction. And currently, this is being done by um, scanning a QR code, right? So I wonder if um, the two workflows uh, could be, can either be informed by each other or reuse the same workflow because here again, imagine uh, scanning a, a QR code when onboarding onto your mobile app or secure desktop app. And so, so what, what you're provisioning is the endpoint of the uh, authorization endpoint, the, the URL to the authorization endpoint, and the DPOP nonce so that your, not, your secure client can now kick off the client authentication ceremony. So that's it. Uh, just reminder, um, verifiable credential folks have that same problem as does PSYOP2. So at least should be informed by, by each other. Thanks. I think the, um, I don't want to get too deep into this nonce issue because I don't feel like that's the most important part to discuss right now. But I do think that that, what you're describing of the enrolling via QR code is kind of a separate issue to this just because uh, a lot of these are going to be pre-configured with the authorization endpoint already kind of in the app. But I could see that, that you could have them both combined as that could be a way to enroll. Anyway, I don't want to get into that because I don't feel like that's a super relevant uh, point here today. OK. Uh, Jacob. Yeah, uh, good presentation. Um, we I have a bunch of security concerns with the spec as it is today. Um, we have a similar implementation of this. And, the, and uh, the fact that the default posture of it is that the, the authentication flow or the authorized sort of in between the authentication there is unauthenticated and not like strictly said, this should probably be client authenticated at some point uh, could lead to a lot of like open implementations of this, especially now that you remove the sort of native word from the spec, because on the web, if you don't have the redirect URI, you don't have a provenance check. So a course, course implementation of this with a, you know, essentially a public client, you would have no idea to know where where that came from, in the end. So that that could lead into, you know, implementation that use defaults that are really really insecure uh, for this, and the the AS wouldn't have any control. So if you were to combine this, say, with attestation to begin with. You need a way to to sort of have that attestation flow through, and I guess you're thinking Depop. I haven't read the updated uh, where you added Depop in there, but Depop obviously can be used throughout 
the authentication flow. But um, have you considered other authentication mechanisms? Because if you authenticate in the beginning, you, you essentially need a token to use throughout the flow. And then why not just simply say it, it should be access token bound throughout. So you yeah. use some initial client to run the flow and then you could attest to get that token or you could strong or, or weak, but, but there's a sort of security baseline that you add to it. So, okay, a couple of things in there. I agree that it would be a bad idea to build a trivial implementation of this that just opens up everything for everybody. Uh, that said, I am a big fan of the approach of layering specs on top of each other, each one solving a separate problem and using them all together. So I would fully expect that um, you absolutely could use whatever is this future client attestation mechanism along with this to protect this endpoint. I don't think we should require it because I think some people may actually be OK with the implications of not using attestation for it for whatever reason. But that would be a good recommendation. Um, the, we can't really do a. The, the, the point of logging into a mobile app is that that's usually the first time that you are in, interacting with a user and you can't really pre-enroll stuff, which is the whole point of mobile apps being public clients. So we can't really like do stuff with pre-enrolling secrets and or tokens in order to protect that endpoint, which is why client attestation is useful in this context. So yes, I agree that there's some concerns there. And I think I have documented them already in the document in the security considerations. Um, I would like to add a mention of client attestation, but I don't really want to point at a draft that is so in flux and not really applicable at the moment. But I would expect to be able to do that with that draft that we have adopted. Jacob, can I ask you to review the latest version? And if you have some concerns, to, to post those to the, to the list, please? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob. Paul. Great presentation. Uh, I think we have like a similar setup for our high assurance uh, use cases. Um, but at the same time, I wondered like if they are like the same party, what is there like a need to standardize these things? So somehow feels like a best best current practice more of. Um, I think I, now I can't remember if this is documented in the draft. I think it is. Um, one of the reasons is that even though it's a first party scenario, the actual parts may be built by different people. So you may have a authorization server product that ships an SDK that is then used by a client developer who has a strong relationship with that product. And it is all considered first party, but they are actually separate pieces of software. So what we're seeing now is that as people are trying to do this, everybody's doing it differently in often bad ways. Yeah, so. I think I think it's a great idea, uh, and um, also a remark that we also intend to use the client attestation. I think it kind of fits in this in this native um, scenario, um, and the thing with the nonce is as these things come up in a lot of places, uh, Giuseppe uh, um, from from Italy. Um, propose to have something like a nonce endpoint, and the more often this comes up, I think the more I think it, we should evaluate this option. So I just want to put this in, in the room because it seems that there's a lot of things coming up where we need nonces, and maybe it's a good opportunity for another endpoint that like can dedicate it just do that on a high scale, also from like a scalability point of view. I feel like that's worth a discussion. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to Giuseppe and see if he he's interested in talking about this here. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, Justin. Hi, Justin Richer. One, uh, thanks for this. Uh, I think that this is this is an interesting uh, gap. And um, that said, though, this would now be the third time we have reinvented um, intent registration in uh, in OAuth two. Uh, the first being uh, the device flow, the second being par, and now this. Uh, they all do similar things, all return different things, and all expect different things to happen after that. So from that point, arguably, they are, you know, are different endpoints. But at one, what point are we going to stop uh, inventing new ways to throw a bunch of authorization request parameters at an authorization server in order to get to the next step in the process? On top of that, um, a lot of these things end up with nonce or nonce-like objects uh, 
baked into them because they were part of an ongoing conversation. And uh, so, yeah, I think that this, this might be a reasonable time to start asking, should we just abstract up from par and figure out what this type of intent registration generally looks like with this go do a proprietary whatever uh, as, as one of the outcomes of it. It's a pattern that works well in other protocols and other spaces that I think could, it, I think it's time for us to start asking that question here. I, I, I do see what you're saying and it, um, it's, an, it's an interesting idea. So maybe it is worth a thought exercise of, of going through what that would look like for kind of upgrading the device flow and making that work like smash it all together and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to talk the nonsense that Paul was bringing up, <laughs> yeah. I had to, I had to, that, um, then, uh, then we should at least talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks, Justin. John. Um, so I too wondered about the relationship with PAR and whether or not this should be layered in some respect. Yes, I, I'm not, I, I have mixed feelings about Giuseppe's idea, um, but we should probably talk about think it. about it. Yeah. Um, my other observation is yes, we should have a more specific profile for passkeys slash web auth in, and perhaps it should be the only profile. Um, because if we're talking about mobile apps, there are no, other than a small subset of phones in China that don't support this, there's no particular reason why you would do almost anything else with a first party app. And you get the advantage of both identifying the user and the application mm -hmm. because the web auth and assertion identifies that yes, it is my app um, just as part of it. Um, so there are some good reasons we've thought about it in the past, but there hasn't been enough justification, but maybe we've reached critical mass and should, we, it should at least exist. And maybe there's an argument for doing it other ways, but maybe there aren't. Thanks, John. Philip. Hi, um, I'm also a big fan of having a lot of layers and then utilizing them to um, do something great. Closer uh, to the mic. Okay, bit. sorry. Can, yeah. Should I eat the whole thing? I yeah, yeah. Um, Hug it. Oh, God. <laughs> um, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> All right. Um, so J Jacob mentioned that they uh, have a, uh, maybe I've misunderstood, but like they have a proprietary implementation and they use an access token uh, that they obtain through other means to talk to an endpoint like this. Um, then we talked in this era of client attestation about yet another application of client attestation uh, at this endpoint as a means for the you know, client authentication, then DCR. And then we, we seem to have mentioned protecting this endpoint both with RFC 6750 derivatives like DPOP and access token, as well as client authentication. And I would really love it if it wasn't both. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Jacob. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm I'm all for standardizing this. I think I think uh, the the problems on overlaying the authorized endpoint are are big, and I I like what Justin said there on on uh, perhaps building something up from par. It's probably time uh, to go in that direction. Uh, there we could we should not be too scared of accept types. Um, or, or content types, uh, so that we could use actual content negotiation and and let the client and the server negotiate a little bit on that endpoint. I mean, it is web protocols. Uh, and to comment on John's comment there on a small subset from China, I, I disagree. We, in our deployments, we see actually quite a significant number of of devices that fail to do attestation because they have a incorrect implementation of the chip or they have a different trust route from Google, uh, not using Google. And for a vendor rolling out their bank application or their whatever application, you know, X percent is not insignificant uh, 
it doesn't have to be even 10 percent but i think it is actually in, in some of these or, or more we've already seen that 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 type of thing fails so there there needs to be various mechanisms uh, besides from attestation depending but the nice thing is you could you could you could have a different fallback and with first party applications you don't have to have the same authentication mechanism if it's not attested you could have something else that that you deem is stronger or more secure on a less secure device Okay, I, I'm I'm gonna let John just reply to this. Sorry, Christina. So my my point was that WebAuthn on devices is universally available, other than a small set of phones from China that don't have Play services, and there's work to address that. Um, you are correct that provenance attestation of the private key that's being used for the WebAuthn attestation, your mileage may vary, but. I also have a solution for that, but I'm not going to do the ad now. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I, I, I misunderstood you. I thought you were talking okay. about the attestation from the device there. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jacob. Christina. Um, two points. So I, I don't want to talk about nonsense, but because there were a few statements made, we did spend a lot of time discussing this in the Bain Foundation's Digital Credential Protocols Working Group. And there is a consensus forming that a new endpoint is not a good idea that imitating DPOP's pattern where there's a nonce returned in the error response is a preferred way because we don't want multiple mechanisms for kind of a similar purpose. And also we do want AS to kind of maintain control over these nonces. And finally, like extra endpoint is, you know, it's additional complexity, which personally I would also like to avoid if we can. Um, so just saying that I'm concerned with kind of reopening that discussion entirely. I thought Paul and Giuseppe were aware of it. Maybe they were not, but we can hopefully get there. Um, second point, on WebAuthn, if you could maybe educate me, does it have to be a profile of this first party app draft or it feels like a mechanism to use pass keys or you know, to get an access token directly is useful for third party apps too? Am I missing something? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of interesting implications of using it for third-party apps. I don't think it's a straight one-to-one -one there. Um, but the but to get to the other part of the question, no, it does not have to be a profile of this. But if we had this for first-party apps, there's a very clear way to slot it in, in a way that people would likely use along with other things, because people, frankly, don't go 100% passkey from for things right now because of all the edge cases. So people do have multiple methods. They might default or prefer passkeys. But it's not a hundred percent, and I l suspect it won't John. be a hundred percent. What were you going? John mad. <laughs> uh, so, uh, very short answer to Christina: There is a difference between first party and third party in that the audience of the web authentication assertion is targeted in the first party case. In the third party case, it adds a complexity because of the of who the audience of the web authentication assertion is is pairwise. But it, that doesn't make it impossible, but it is a different challenge. Thank you, John. Christina, you want to wrap it up are. quickly? Would we really like to, under such complexities, we'd like to pursue kind of, you know, okay. that. Well, you know where to find me. Peter, <laughs> Peter, you want to quickly? Uh, yeah, just very quickly. Um, some of the, I think one of the things that, we see with things like, uh, yes, passkeys is the future, et cetera. There is also plenty of customers that have other solutions deployed and will probably have for a while. So we do need some, we do need some kind of cover while we transition. And I, you know, one of the ideas is that this can be a stepping stone uh, on, uh, and help us get there as well. Uh, I, and then I think that I see the chair giving me the eyes. Yes. So I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, OK. Thanks. I'm uh, so leave the stage and come back. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so so you, you got lots of great feedback. There is lots of work to be done. It's great work. So let's like let, let's talk about that nonce thing, that that the the different yeah profile. the profile all, all of those. Yeah. So let's so there's clear yeah, the ball both end, obviously, right? So yeah. there's lots of good feedback here. Um keep going and hopefully after that we can Kind of look into adopting this document if there's interest. Okay, awesome. Thank you all. Okay, let me stop. This. Okay, now I'm going to leave and come back. <laughs> okay, where is uh, this? Is the, this one? Okay.
Okay, and you have. I have exactly, exactly 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah, so I told you, I told you, I didn't have too much time. Well, 20 minutes and 20 minutes. All right. <laughs> that, that's what I allocated for you in the first place. Right? Perfect. Okay. Hi, Aaron Parecki again. Um, Christina, are you already in the queue? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I haven't even started. <laughs> um, can you give me slides? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so today, I, uh, now I want to talk about global token revocation. Um, I originally had a different draft in the agenda here today. I'm sorry for swapping it uh, short notice, but I'm assuming nobody read the slides anyway, so it's probably <laughs> fine. <laughs> Philip did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Philip. I, <laughs> so um, they are actually related problems, and what the reason I, I changed it was because the original thing I was going to talk about is kind of like the two steps ahead of things so, uh, solving the problem that's two steps ahead. And I want to kind of back up and solve a more immediate version of the problem in a much simpler way, which is what I'm going to talk to you about now. Um, so OK, OAuth, we have a client authorization server. And um, in many cases, the way that those get referred to is an app and the app's backend or API, especially in the case of things where you kind of just treat it as, you know, you download the Slack app, and you're like, I'm using the Slack app. And you may have actually logged into the Slack authorization server in that process. Now, sometimes you actually do log in to these applications through an actually external identity provider that is not the authorization server. In particular, enterprise IDPs, social login IDPs. Um, so we actually have these kind of three different roles involved in this picture. Now. There are many situations in which these external things, external to the authorization server that issued the tokens, might want to revoke tokens. So that could be a signal from the enterprise identity provider, or it could be things like external security monitoring tools that this application system has deployed themselves that they may want to be monitoring log files and sending signals back to their AS. So the reason I bring this up is because um, the the, the goal here is to create a token revocation API that provides applications that currently exist today who have deployed OAuth with the shortest path to implement this kind of token revocation uh, interoperably. I'm a big fan of doing homework and researching existing standards and documenting how do what, what's out there, how does it solve the problem, how does it not solve the problem, and how does it relate to the problem I have at hand. So I'm going to go through these really quick. We have token revocation, RFC 7009 developed right here. Um, the reason this is not applicable to the situation is because this is client initiated. The whole goal here is the OAuth client that has the token sends that token to the server and says, please revoke this token. And then it, the server may also revoke related tokens, and that's kind of left as an implementation exercise. Um, but the point here is that it, it, the input is the access token itself, and it is driven by the client, and that is not ambiguous in the spec. OpenID Connect has front channel logout. Front channel logout is also client initiated, so it doesn't really apply here, and I don't really need to go into more detail there. OpenID back channel logout is much more related because OpenID back channel logout does have a server side endpoint at the OpenID provider that is expected to receive requests to revoke things. However, it actually mostly talks about revoking sessions. There are zero mentions of the term access token in the spec. And mm, I read it. <laughs> no, I read it. And there, <laughs> there is a mention of refresh tokens. However, importantly, it actually says refresh tokens issued with the offline access property should not be revoked. And that is because this is designed for a particular purpose. And the purpose that I am trying to solve now is no actually revoke everything. So. Um, that is a, you could maybe you know argue that maybe we could just update this or change it or blah, 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 or you just ignore the should, fine. Uh, but there is a larger point, which is that many of these applications that have deployed OAuth servers actually don't deploy OpenID Connect in any form. And they may not have gone anywhere near OpenID Connect because they have only ever dealt with their OAuth client and their OAuth server. So uh, they may integrate with upstream IDPs, sometimes through SAML, Sometimes not even through OpenID Connect. Uh, so OpenID Connect is kind of a whole new world to open up to them. In particular, the input to the back channel logout is a JSON web token. 
which means JSON Web Token validation as opposed to more simpler kind of API key or, or bearer token validation. So it is a lot more work to say to somebody, go implement back channel logout uh, because it kind of opens up this world that they may not have any relationship with yet. Then there's the shared signals framework. Now this is starting to get a lot closer to what we're talking about. Um, CAPE, the continuous access evaluation profile, that is actually much more of a hint or suggestion from one thing to another about the state of things that have happened. And the expectations of what happens when somebody receives that is not guaranteed. It's not meant to be a command. Risk, on the other hand, is definitely getting to the closer, stronger language of like, hey, you know, this user's session was terminated. You should probably terminate the other session as well. Um, so that's a lot closer. Uh, however, both of these, the mechanisms that they use to kind of set them up and bootstrap, there are multiple steps involved. It's a lot of back and forth. There's exchanges that happen to even establish this kind of link. OK, I know a lot of people are probably want to respond to this, but let me keep going. Because the other thing that I like to do when talking about standards is look at existing implementations of things that solve the same problem in proprietary ways. So I found four apps, Zoom, Box, Slack, and Zendesk. If you are on the PDF version of the slides, these link to API docs. These are APIs that currently exist by products that have OAuth, API, OAuth servers that have an endpoint that does exactly what I want, which is the input is a user identifier, and then they will delete tokens and sessions of that user. These exist, and they are not consistent, you might notice. So I've gone and given you like a shorthand version of the API docs to see how different they are syntactically. But the behavior is the same, and the input is also the same. It's a user identifier of some sort. In these examples, it is a user ID, opaque user ID, or an email address, or some of them accept both. So if we take all of this context, then the simplest thing we can do is to create a new revocation endpoint, which is in this draft, which I have published today. So, uh, <laughs> OK, <laughs> sorry. We're, we're, but, hold on, hold but, on. We're going to call for adoption right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Three yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, but I know like dropping a draft on a Friday afternoon is like not very friendly. However, not best current um, practice, best current <laughs> practice <laughs> but the draft is extremely, extremely simple. And I can show it to you in one slide. Oh, not that slide. <laughs> that slide. Uh, it's essentially just here is the user to revoke tokens for and uh, the end. So let me, let me back up because I do actually want to go through these, uh, these points. So the input to this draft is a security event token subject identifier, which is almost an RFC. It's not quite yet, but it's very close. Um, so the input is a subject identifier identifying a user. The authentication of this endpoint is required. However, it is out of scope, just like token introspection requires authentication of the endpoint, but is left out of scope. Um, I basically just copied the language from that. So the outcome of calling this endpoint with authentication and a subject identifier is the authorization server must revoke all refresh tokens. It should revoke access tokens. But most importantly, it must prevent issuing new access tokens and refresh tokens without reauthenticating the user. I have chosen these words extremely carefully. You might recognize this end result is that the user is, quote, logged out. However, I did not want to mention the term logout in the spec, because that kind of opens up a can of worms. The actual goal, though, is um, in RFC 6749, there is a step which is called the authorization server authenticates the user. That step is out of scope of OAuth. Great. That's good. What I want is to tell an authorization server, you have to re-authenticate the user. That's really what being logged out means, is you have to go through authentication again. So that's the actual goal is terminate all existing tokens, re-authenticate the user. Now, if somebody wants to implement this by keeping onto some sort of session cookie that identifies who they were so they know how to authentic authenticate them faster in the future, go ahead. I'm not saying delete all context about the user. I'm saying re-authenticate the user when they come back. Um, so yeah, the input is either a subject identifier, which would be an email address, 
This is from the SEC event subject identifier draft, or the input could be an opaque user ID as many systems currently have implemented. Um, the response to this is basically just, are you gonna do the thing? So if, you, if the authorization server accepts the request and will proceed to terminate and re uh, revoke refresh tokens, revoke access tokens, then it just returns 204, or it could return an error code because of whatever. Um, and I do spell out a couple of the error cases in here, but there importantly is no response body because there's not really any need to know more than just did it work. Um, so not going to ask for working group adoption, obviously, but please do read the draft. And I would be happy to take any questions um, how about, in the next 10 minutes. How about work group last call? Yeah, even uh, better. Uh, We're on a roll. OK, yeah, John. <laughs> So um, I think that uh, we should, cons or we, you, eventually, um, should consider adding some an optional session identifier. So that was one of the things in OpenID Connect back channel logout that we had. Because there are times when you may have states coming in from different places. So just because I want to destroy all of the access tokens for my web application doesn't mean that I want all of the access tokens for all of my uh, phones yep. and my iPad and everything else disconnected. So having an having an optional session identifier um, yep. would be useful, and perhaps we could eventually combine the OpenID Connect back channel output or back channel logout with a new endpoint, or making somehow converge it so that we don't don't have duplication because this is essentially the mechanism that we had in that that spec. Um, so that is closer to what I was what I had in the original version of what I was going to present today of doing more targeted logout from more of that different kinds of context. One input being session identifier. Another input might be device identifier. That's a larger conversation. And I wanted to start with the base case of no, I really do want to nuke everything, just like nuke it from orbit, user logs in again, simple, and we'll expand it from there. I, I understand, but the the reaction we got from people like Google, et cetera, was no, we can't do that because it would cause untold havoc without a session identifier. Thanks, John. Justin. Okay, so neat idea. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, this uh, mimics a lot of stuff in the existing revocation draft. Uh, have you thought about using this for direct token management as well? Or is this really intended to be user-focused and user-bound? This is really meant to be when the, this is really meant to cover the case of there is no token available as input. Right, OK. No, that's great. Um, the. OK, never mind. That actually answered the second question I had, so I'm going to sit down. Great. Thanks, Justin. Mike. Mike Jones, you made me curious about what Back Channel did and didn't say uh, when you asserted that it didn't talk about revoking access tokens, which it doesn't. It does talk about clearing all state associated with the session, which at least my interpretation of it covers that. Um, how, yes and no. It does kind of imply that there is one session when, in fact, there might be multiple. And again, it's not explicit, and you could in, go either way on that when you interpret it, but it's, it's, it's ambiguous there. Fair. I'm just pointing out that there's language that you could do better than. Yeah. Um, and also, it talks about some of the state associated with the session being things like HTML5 local storage and cookies. And I don't know the degree to which you want to say those words in your draft or yeah. say that you disclaim them. But the more specific we are, probably the less confused, confusion there will be among developers trying to do things. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting point, yeah. OK. Thanks, I would, Mike. I would generalize that to say that it's about whether it should also clear client state rather than just revoke the client's tokens, which are two kind of different problems. Yeah. yeah. George. George. Um, I guess I have a little bit of concerns around the 404 response. I mean, I really Me liked Me the, um, 
the, the existing token revocation that you get a 200 back every time, I, especially if some people are going to use API keys as their authentication mechanism. I don't know that we want to create more ways to figure out which users have existing sessions at places that are relatively easy to compromise. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, I was on board with the first part of that. So, but I, but I, I don't. You, you put, but the input is a is not an access token. It's nothing that the client has. It's no, it's it's, it's, it's a, pre established secret API key. Right. So to me, API keys are not very secret. They don't tend to be secret, right? So there's there's a security element there, right? And and the input is an identifier that is largely known from all of our breaches, yeah. right? So I. It, you know, if I, we strengthened the 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 authorization elements, right? Of how the the um, like if you if you pushed it, you know, you push the authorization requirements more than just saying they're out of scope. It, it may be okay, but so I I'm on board with strongly preferring better better authentication mechanisms like private key jot or asymmetric mechanisms rather than shared secrets. Um, but I don't think realistically that should be a requirement for this endpoint. Um, Cause I feel like it does add more barriers to, to building this. Um, but uh, I'm all in favor of strongly encouraging it and even including it as the default in the examples. Well, so I guess the first thing is, is I would take it out because if it's not needed, nobody's asking for it, then it's a better, th the, the 404. Right. That was my my concern was the 404 response. So if we just are, so are you are you concerned about the 404 in a, in that it can indicate whether a user email or an email address exists? Yeah, and whether there's an active session of that there, right? And and if the expectation is like, why does the IDP need to know that it whether can, it was we can valid or not? we can dig into that and determine yeah. if that's needed? Yeah. So. Uh, I actually just wanted to respond to George super quick. That's why I got in queue. If I Go could. ahead. Um, so the the reason that token revocation responds with uh, with a two hundred every time is that it is a uh, a best effort um, type of response. That is uh, that the two hundred response is or you know two hundred four no content is the AS saying got the message. I'll figure it out. Your part's over, and you know I'm. I'm, I'm not making any promises beyond I got your message, which was well formed and I understood it. Even if there are no tokens, even if there are no sessions, even if there are nothing else, because the expectation of the client is that it's going to do the same thing every time. I'm not convinced that's entirely the same here, but I feel like it is. And that's something that if we adopt this, we will definitely need to be very careful how we yeah. specify that yeah. in order to figure out the kinds of things George was talking about with the same context. Thank you. Yeah. Dimitri. Dimitri Zagdulin, uh, also on the same topic. So the 404 is definitely a red flag from the perspective of discovering either that a uh, user has an account or that the user has an active session, depending on how uh, you're planning to model it. And there's only two real options uh, to mitigate that. One is, as George mentioned, to always signal success, right? So that it's regardless whether a user exists or not, just as Justin mentioned, not just because it's the best best effort thing, <clears throat> but also for security. So regardless of what you post there, success. The other, the, the alternative option that uh, APIs have used to, to mitigate this is to always return a 404 if the user is A, unauthenticated, or B, unauthorized. So. 401s and 403s automatically turn into 404s to mask the presence of the account. Yeah, and again, I just want to reiterate, the thing making this request is nothing to do in the user context. It is a security monitoring tool. It is a IDP that the user has an account at that they use to sign into this. None of that is in the context of the user, so those kinds of considerations don't apply. The concern here that I agree with is if one of those tools is compromised and someone's able to extract its API key, it could then use it at the IDP to pr probe for user accounts. But that's pretty deep level of compromise. Uh, so like, it's worth talking about, but it's not at all the same as 
an open endpoint that's used for registration or password recovery that's user input especially unauthenticated, returning those error codes. OK, we, we are almost out of time. I'm going to give David the uh, last word here. David, uh, thanks, sure. Dimitri. Two, two points. I'll try to be quick. Um, first is we probably need to think about how this cascades uh, up and down. So uh, to keep picking on Slack, the example where I have an enterprise IDP signaling I should um, do something to affect all uh, sessions for user on Slack doesn't doesn't necessarily mean uh, this should cascade up, but we should you know put more thought into that. Uh, second uh, is somewhat related to that because the intents uh, behind these are usually not captured. And it seems like the primary ones actually the um, kind of the logout signal, which I I've in the past summarized as. Um, a signal that the person who comes back next time might not be the same user. So we may not even need to revoke tokens if, say, the system itself has a way to suspend use until there's a user interaction. Um, so things like removing uh, state uh, apply uh, an additional uh, subtext of, you know, you know, something malicious actually happened that we may not actually have at this API level unless, you know, we go ahead and define it. I'm the, what I'm taking from that is that you're talking more about client state again. Um, and I do actually specifically want to target the tokens that an authorization server has issued, not just client state. So that's, yeah. Uh, okay. Let, let's continue that discussion yeah, on the right. list. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for all the presenters. Um, and thank you for all attendees and, and for your contribution. Um, See you hopefully in Brisbane.